Hi, good evening. Today is Friday, June 18th. We had a very interesting day in the markets, very uneven. But uh, before we get to the markets, I think there is one interesting thing that happened, for, and that's the major difference between US and Europe, is that EU has just announced that starting July 1st, they will have digital pa COVID passports in EU, and they're coming to Canada as well. So I guess the most progressive and free countries will have the most restrictive uh, traveling rules, but that's no surprise. Again, there is a short distance between uh, progressivism and socialism dictatorship, but you know, you already had that, uh, can I have your papers before during the World War II? So I'm not sure why they're trying to do that again. So in, on that note, I'm surely glad <laughs> that I live in Florida where we had free travel, no masks, for a very long time and seem to be doing just fine but the media wouldn't stop scaring us and now there is this new delta variance that's like super dangerous coming in it's it's it seems like there is no end to covid scares every time there's a new variant and they keep counting them meanwhile our governor in florida finally stopped that nonsense and stopped reporting new covid cases altogether as they should, you know, why don't we just count all the flu cases as well while we're at it or every case of common cold or pneumonia or anything else that's super deadly. Let's focus on car crashes. You know, that's number one killer probably anyway, outside of health issues. One of the things I think is interesting is uh, uh, here over the last few days, I've gone to some different stores. Like I was in Home Depot yesterday and it was the first time that I noticed I walked in with mask on just because people, you know, in the past, they always wanted a mask. But I, as soon as I walked in there, there were like, I saw like six guys without a mask on. So I uh, won't forget this. I took a ride off and, you know, happy to be maskless finally. And uh, I've, I've noticed that at a number of different stores here recently here in New Jersey that um, it, it just seems that just within the last week, there's been uh, kind of a liberation of, of of people from the masks. Right? Don't you miss our favorite doctor on TV telling us how we can still <laughs> wear masks even if we're vaccinated? Forever. <laughs> or but, two masks. We need two masks uh, at the same time. So. But you know, in while they had the G seven. That's another one of those things. They all had this six feet di distance for the picture, all wearing masks. But then the second they're off camera, they all body bodies, you know, whispering to each other, no masks, it's all fine. But on cameras, they had to do that charade. And so they, then people are surprised, why don't we trust them? Well, because of your double standards, like you said, if not for the double standards, we would have no standards at all, so. Yeah, it's just, um, it's amazing just, yeah, how, how they, and, and also in his emails, how he was talking about, you know, the, the value of mass and, and that it was mainly at, basically admitting back in February and March that it was largely performative and that it was just to show people how serious it was. And, uh, but, but then they couldn't back out of that. Um, you know, strongly advocating and they couldn't just reverse themselves for, for whatever reason. Right. <laughs> but uh, speaking of double standards, it seemed like we had a huge double standards in the markets today. Mm -hmm. There was a um, very big difference in the way NASDAQ versus ES have been behaving in the last couple of days. So um, S&P 500 uh, tried to rebound yesterday to 4228 mm -hmm. level which I was mentioning that in my view, we needed to get above to be bullish, but we failed to, to close or rebound above that level yesterday. And this morning we had a large gap down way below uh, yesterday's low. And again, after the open, we tried to rebound, but the yesterday's low seemed to be a very tall uh, order barrier to cross. And we sold off at the end of the day again and closed on the low. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have a gap down on Monday just to scare people off more, but I think that will be a good buy, at least for a trade, if we have a gap down, obviously use the risk wisely and stop loss or whatever, 
but it's if it is, it's probably a good trade because it doesn't look like it's an overall scary market sell-off. If you look at NASDAQ as a counterbalance to that, NASDAQ barely sold off in the last uh, couple of days. It actually made new highs, I think, yesterday. <clears throat> it did. And today just was down only uh, 1%. But, but on the other hand, uh, Russell 2000 was, um, looks a lot more bearish right now on its, on its chart, and it, it sold off throughout the day. But then what's, what's even, to make it even more odd, there are some key stocks that, that I, I think of as sort of these momentum stocks that, are, um, that, that they were actually up for the day, uh, slightly even. Um, like Regeneron or Adamera, uh, these stocks um, were for the most part, or a lot of these were were up today. Uh, so even some of the biotechs that I that I watched, they were they were all up um, you know, half a percent or so. So what I found interesting is that Arc uh, Innovation ETF, which is um, it's it's a lot of these. Um, some of these stocks, both in biotech and in tech space, that that I was just showing, that this one was up today. It was up a third of a percent, and then Tesla was up today, which is a holding of of that Ark Innovation Fund. Also, Coinbase. Coinbase was down today, but it it actually did try to rally um, throughout the day, and then it sold off with other things toward the end of the day. So it was it was odd to see. Coinbase rallying today, given the big sell-off that was happening in crypto. So what's how can how can that be? It seems to have been uh, following Bitcoin really closely over the last few months since the IPO, but it didn't today. It, it sort of moved counter trend, which was um, counterintuitive. It didn't it didn't seem to make sense. Right, and I, I think it has to do with two things. For once, we had obviously options expirations today. And there were lots of uh, rebalancing that has been happening because of the bonds move. In the last two days, it was a very, very big move in bonds where uh, the bonds, um, I guess, break out again. So it wasn't really a fake breakout. It was just a pullback and the bond seems to be moving up again. We had very two strong days. Yeah. In, in very bonds. strong. Really, right. really, it's been an uptrend for um, you know, weaker Right. So no, uh, across the board and bonds. Right. It was just a little pullback on uh, Fed announcement, and then we're back moving up. So, uh, on top of this, all this kind of caused the inflation expectations tanked a little bit and took down lots of uh, metals with them for the last two days. Um, gold, silver, and copper. Uh, well, we talked about copper last two days that the move is not done last two days ago. So the copper sold off a lot as well in the last two days. Yeah, copper closed right as low. And um, crude uh, actually was up a little bit today, but then it, it sold off a little bit throughout the day. Right. Uh, but then all of the agricultural commodities, they, they seem to rally throughout the day. So it was just some odd rebalancing, or maybe it right. could have been um, also short positions being closed, these types of things that lead to some counter trend moves. Right. And because of the um, rates, the financials sold off a lot. So that brought down Russell. But on the lower rates, the NASDAQ actually didn't sell off as much because lower rates are better for NASDAQ. So all of those moves have been. I guess lots of funds rebalancing. So we'll see where it takes us next week. But I don't think this divergence can last a very long time where we have NASDAQ just hanging on there. Either NASDAQ has to give and sell off with the rest of the market or the rest of, or it could pull the rest of the market back up with it. But um, we shall see next. This is, um, you know, if in fact, the inflation thesis is dead, I mean, which I don't think it is, but because I think it, it's going to be a tug of war for a while, it's not like right. it's clear uh, where, where prices are going. 
And uh, but if if what we saw was a sell off due to inflation thesis being challenged, why would um, financials have sold off so so sharply today, off well over two percent, even more than the Nasdaq, or even more than the Russell two thousand? They didn't like the rates. I don't know. Well, the threat of increased rates, but but um, yeah, the threat. In the but, U.S. dollar, we talked about this as well. Uh, it had another two strong days, so it's it's a really large move in, in U.S. dollar as well. So all of those things seem to be some rebalancing definitely going on under the surface of this. And we'll see where uh, next week leads. But uh, like I said, either NASDAQ is going to sell off to catch up or it pulls everything else and we keep going. But if we look at the... Um, somebody posted on Twitter, and I need to pull that uh, um, graph, that the week after the expiration could be a little dicey. It's uh, next week usually down... 87% of the time since 1991. But if the OPEC week is down like now, then it's also down 10 out of 12 days last time. So 83% down. So next week, um, if that study in particular is valid, then next week could be down as well based on this week. So we'll see. Well, cer certainly in crypto, in the crypto space, um, we had a big um, sell off. We actually had a, a rally um, uh, almost up to, and I'll, I'm going to go to a daily chart here first. But um, we, we had a really nice rally that for, for Bitcoin, is, at least, was right up to just under its resistance at 42,000, where that was where the breakdown really happened um, during the sell off. But we had a big sell off, but then it really broke down. And that and and well, that's where we are today, back below that breakdown level, and so it got up to about 41,400, 41, uh, and then reverse and and it sold off. Um, right now, it's uh, below what I what was the um, immediate post crash support, but. Now it's at kind of a lower support level, which is um, it's it you know it's not I don't consider it that bullish in the near term. It's a pretty um, somewhat somewhat bearish, but on on maybe the bullish on the bullish side, we did make a um, a higher high, and if it bounces here, then it's a higher low as well. So that might be um, something to if you're if you're looking for some hopium, as they say, <laughs> and you know this would be where it would be that we we made a higher high, and we're we're potentially making a higher low here. I think that Bitcoin is going to if if we are going to rally here, Bitcoin is going to lead the way up. Uh, if you look at something like some of the um, ratios against Bitcoin, like in Ethereum, um, we're now at a level where it, it may be close to a bottom for Ethereum. It could go, it could go lower. It could go down in the mid fifties. Uh, that wouldn't be at all unusual for um, either under a continued sell-off or if it were to rally here. I, would, I think that Bitcoin is going to be the stronger, uh, the strongest um, crypto. There might be some small exceptions, but I think that's generally the case. So something like a or Cardano or uh, Polkadot, all of these against Bitcoin, they they kind of they topped out, and I, I see it as just um, a gentle downtrend in all of these uh, at this point because Bitcoin's going to be the, the leader. Um, we'll have these little rallies here. I'm not I'm not saying it's like down <laughs> every every stick, but um, but I think that the trend in the near term is down. Uh, so Bitcoin's the strongest. Um, it, and we're, we're potentially at a place where it did bounce a little bit, but it's, it's got to bounce a lot more to be to get back to a more bullish um, state. And, and what 
I would say there's if, if it if it does rally, if it does manage a rally here, then the, the big test is at this 42,000 level for, for Bitcoin. And then if um, I, I don't think that Ethereum is going to be able to get to this kind of level in the near term, as long as uh, we're in this kind of risk off state. But the real test for um, the, the next test for Ethereum is going to be getting back above this uh, support that goes back to January, which now is at about 2,400. And then this, um, it was support and now it's resistance is this 25, 25 level. So both of these are immediate, you know, if, if there's some upside here, there'll, there'll be a test um, for, for Ethereum. And then what we're, what we're continuing to see is some big sell-offs in um, these uh, DeFi, decentralized finance coins like a Uniswap. Um, they're just relentlessly selling off. They're all broken looking. And so, uh, or something like a synthetics, which is, <coughs> excuse me, back down to January levels. And so there, there's some value in, in some of these and it, it will take some, I would say, uh, do, do, to look across the scope of them. But the things that I like to look at are the, um, the ratio of the price to the total or, or the market cap to the total value locked. So one like Curve, they have, uh, let's say uh, like $3 billion in total value locked or more than that now, I think 4 billion. And yet their, um, it, it's, their market cap is a, a small fraction of that, maybe like one-tenth of that. So it's, if you're valuing it like you would a, a, finan a financial stock, it's actually a little bit undervalued from that standpoint. They could generate, if they can generate you know, 1% income on their assets, or two percent income income on their assets, not revenue, but income, then they they could pay that out to the token holders, and it could be really nice um, income um, uh, holding down the line. Uh, these are all very new, so it's not like they've matured to the point that they're. The you know, curve is actually doing some payouts. I think it pays out about five percent, roughly a five percent dividend, but the um, but so there's there's some value in some of these, but um, it's... well, I, I think it could be one of the reasons that they sold off is the meltdown of Iron, and Mark Cuban has been in the news because he's been an early investor in that, and Mark Cuban now calls for stablecoin regulations after he lost some of his money in that Iron meltdown, which was one of the stable coins that. Something was programmatically wrong, if I understand, that there was a mistake in the, in the program and the whole thing unraveled to zero or something. Oh, yeah. Basically, it went from 60 to zero in a very short time. But the, Usually, um, it's like zero to 60 in a few seconds, not 60 to zero. Well, that's, you know, they go both ways. I mean, and that's why um, if people, people ask me, well, what? how can you have these kinds of rates of return in decentralized finance? And it's partly because there are, well, there are risks like that. And that would be a, a specific type of risk that that is, is referred to as smart contract risk, where there's mm -hmm. um, that instead of there being like a human being sitting there managing um, you know, the risk, it's all done by code. And so if the code has some kind of flaw in it, then everything blows up. There's not a human overseeing it or a regulator per se. Now, would there be, could, I, I would say that's probably actually the area where regulators will step in is if someone or some company purports to have what they call a stable coin, then there will have to be kind of truth in advertising. <laughs> And that that they'll have to show that you know we've got the assets backing it up in a bank, and that if you like USDC, what's called USD US dollar coin, that you can at say Coinbase or Gemini or some of these others, you can redeem it 
always for you know one USDC for one dollar or back or forth, and um, and so there's because they have the backing in U.S. banks, um, so uh, maybe th there could be something like Iron in the future, where but they just can't call themselves a stable coin because they don't have that kind of um, the collateral, the backing. And, and um, I, I do see that, you know, that's an area where, um, you know, regu regulation can actually add value, where there's a little bit of truth in advertising rather than, um, rather than uh, you know, trying to get in and manage the books, and things like that, but that's generally where it, it's more cumbersome than, than it is helpful, but in my view. But but I, I do I do think that uh, there's some value in some of these some of these uh, decentralized finance like say Curve or a Uniswap which was uh, for a little while um, it you know it, it it got really pounded down to down to something like twelve here during this during the sell off I don't think it'll touch that level again because there's um, uh, there's there's a a, a lot of value is by far, it's trading more volume, more transaction volume than Coinbase on a daily basis. And, and so it's, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, potential value here that's, that's maybe being discarded right now. Something like synthetics, uh, some of these are, there, you know, there are some reasons for the sell-offs and something like synthetics where they had a lot of liquidations, but on the other hand, uh, synthetics, they, um, they, all the lending that they do is collateralized by 1000%. Uh, I mean, look at like a, a, a regular bank, like say a Wells Fargo or a JP Morgan, they have a coverage of something like 15%, 14%, even under Basel III, whereas um, the coverage of something like synthetics is 1000%. So even though they had some liquidations, they still have a very, um, it, it, there, there's still good collateralization. It's just, uh, uh, it's just in, in, um, in this kind of market, there's just more fear than greed right now. And, and that's, that's what I think you're seeing is the, the other end of things from when um, Dogecoin was hitting new highs every day. And now it's, um, yeah, well, it no. finally broke uh, thirty cents. So, right, and I, I, as I, I've said before, I think it's done at this time. I, I think um, it's not to say there won't be other um, kind of meme coins that people can write up if if that's what they want to do. But I think this one's done, and um, I could I could be wrong about that. It could pop for some reason. Uh, you get some new celebrity on on board or something, but. Um, but I, I, I think it's probably played out, uh, it just doesn't have, if it had, um, thousands of developers, like there are for Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of these others, Polkadot or something, then there might be some basis for, for being the number six or seven coin in market cap, but it doesn't have that. It doesn't have anybody developing for it. And that's um that's where the long term value is going to come, but the right. uh, but but that chain where Iron meltdown on it was Polygon chain is that also trading was that affected by that Iron indirectly so they're uh, they are um, it's called um, Polygon or Matic so it did have a big um, sell off here with that and it was about about Iron and so a more more aggressive sell off than the rest of the market. Uh, but this, on the other hand, they've had huge growth, and that's part of what's kept it up is that there's um, they are uh, kind of centralized. What's called a it's some people call it a side chain to Ethereum, but it's really what's called a commit chain, where it's a little bit of a technical distinction. But they're kind of a side chain, or, or they're trying to be um, off offload some of the uh, some of the, the transaction volume and they've grown very rapidly 
over the last um, something like 10 uh, X in the value lot from, let me see, oh, from, from March. So enormous growth in uh, the, the use and transactions that are happening on Polygon. But the, um, <clears throat> the problem is it, it's not necessarily the fault of Polygon. There's something like iron blew up there, but right. it, it doesn't look good, right? It doesn't, it's not their fault, but it doesn't look good. Um, right, well, also it is interesting. Michael J. Burry from The Big Short was tweeting a lot this weekend. I mean, not this weekend, yesterday and today. He said that the problem with crypto, as in most things, is the leverage. If you don't know how much leverage is in crypto, you don't know anything about crypto, no matter how much else you think you know. And it was interesting because Victor was also saying that about the invasive species and saturation in crypto. So I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Leverage. Okay, so on, um, on the invasive species thing, I'm, I, I, I did respond on the spec, on the spec list. And um, I, I think, I'm not sure that the analogy holds because what, uh, there, there are a lot of models of like predator prey and invasive species, and that goes back to even um, early 20th century. Some of the, that kind of modeling. Uh, the, the the problem is is that with the, the one of the uh, commonly stated obje uh, objections to crypto from traditional finance people is that well, there's it doesn't cost anything to create a new coin, and there's just this profusion of coins that come on the market and, you know, they hear about it on CNBC or some other um, uh, 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 TV or in the media somewhere. And it just seems like, well, there's all this crap, but it would be like, in my view, like, um, uh, like it's a little bit of the sensationalism that gets, it's, it's sensationalized. It would be like if every penny stock that, tripled or went up by 10x overnight were covered by CNBC. Well, why don't they cover that stuff? It's, it's, it's not in their, it, it, it's, they filter it out. They filter out information that makes stocks look like a casino, but they like to promote this kind of meme or this soundbite that crypto is a casino. Whereas there are people like me and there are a lot of serious investors that we do that filtering. I filter out every you know, Shiba Inu and Dogecoin and all these silly memes that are just like penny stock, equivalents of penny stocks. So um, what in the long term is going to generate value and why this is something that is, in my view, it's not a replacement, as some people would say, to the traditional finance system. The traditional finance system has its place and it will always exist. But in my view, it's a a very good complement and a maybe a competitor in the sense that like um, maybe a competitor in the sense that like say electric cars are competitor to traditional gas powered cars that will they ever completely replace them? Probably not, but they encourage efficiency improvements and better fuel efficiency. And, and, and then maybe over time there's a shift, but, it's a, over a very long time period, not uh, you know a snap of a finger over two years or something, and so um, so I guess that the, the issue of so maybe on the issue of like the number of coins, I don't see that as an issue because any reasonable person that really invests in a space is filtering out all the crap, and they're not really paying attention to it. And in the end, there's a power law that gets applied. And just as there's an S&P 500 and then a Russell 2000 that comes after that, there's really only about, um, let's say, four to 6,000 stocks that are legitimate stocks. And there may be another 10,000 penny stocks or over-the-counter bulletin board stocks that are just completely filtered out. They're not, they might not even be listed on, or, or you can't even pull up a quote on something like Google Finance because they why have a data for something that only trades once every two days or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's uh, one thing. I, I don't think, I think that there's, um, 
only only going to be in the end a few hundred or maybe a thousand at the most crypto that have any kind of value in a longer run because it's just there are only so many developers there are only so many um uh reasons for something to hold on to its value and not just be right. you know a flash in a pan on the issue of leverage i think that uh, i like uh, mike burry a lot and i do agree with him on many things and he was brilliant in his assessment of uh, what the actually what the profit potential was for buying the um, credit default swaps was when everyone wanted to be a seller. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think he's just looking at the centralized exchanges and what's happened over the last, um, really last two years, but the, the, there's been an explosion over the last year in decentralized finance. And I think that it changes the risk dynamics quite a bit. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, some of these, um, some of some decentralized finance, it's not, it, although the underlying it all is lending, it's um, over collateralized lending. And so there's in a way, uh, there's uh, the leverage is upside down from the traditional uh, finance system. That may not be the case on a on a centralized exchange. They may be lending, you know, up to whatever the regulatory limits are uh, in their jurisdiction. But on um, but what the um, in like a, a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, there's more volume being traded on Uniswap than on Coinbase. So that's where the growth is really happening, and. I, I think it's sort of less visible to people that are just paying attention to the Binance and Coinbase and, and uh, these centralized exchanges. So I, I'm um, not as convinced of his argument that, mm -hmm. I mean, definitely in any kind of speculative market, they can go down just as fast as they go up. No question about that. But I don't think the leverage is the, um, I, I'd say the um, maybe the thing that I would uh, say is that look at the leverage of the federal government, <laughs> look at the balance sheet of the federal government, of the Federal Reserve, of corporate America, which the debt has been piled on hugely over the last several years. His interest rates have been very low. Right. To be fair, he doesn't discriminate just crypto. He said that. Uh... It's simple. It's greatest speculative bubble of all time in all things by two orders of magnitude. So, and he before he also said that all hype speculation is doing is drawing in retail before the mother of all crashes. Fear of missing out. Parabolas don't resolve sideways. When crypto falls from trillions or meme stocks from fall from tens of billions, Main Street loses. And this will approach the size of countries. History ain't changed. So he's. Um, well, what do you sell? Okay, so you you say that this is a speculative bubble. What do you sell it for? Dollars. I mean, that's the question. I mean, that's the most leveraged currency of all. Um, it's where it's the source of all of the leverage. If it weren't for the dollar being the, I mean, what. Would we have, could the United States have the debt that it does if the United States dollar were not the world's reserve currency uh, following the breakdown of Bretton Woods too? I mean, it's, it's um, there's enormous assumptions of a monetary stability that in a true crisis wouldn't, <laughs> they'd all break down, right? And what, what, what would be the alternative? Where, what would you sell it for? What's the alternative to, uh, I'm not saying there's no alternative risk assets, but in the end, uh, the source of the leverage is the, is the, is the dollar itself. <laughs> right. And um, speaking of the dollar, we didn't even talk about the fact that the Fed keeps changing their stance from dovish to hawkish and back to dovish and back to hawkish. So today, uh, again, St. Louis President, Fed Chair Jim Bullard came out and said that 
uh, the Fed has tilted a lot more, a bit more hawkish again, and that there is some upside risk on the inflation forecast, that they're discussing taper and that they also have a little concern about the housing market and they're leaning towards maybe not needing to buy the mortgage-backed securities as well. So that also kind of affected the markets today. So the, the Fed itself, it seems to be maybe split in, in some people want to raise rates and concerned about the inflation and some do not. So that spooked the markets as well a, a little bit. Well, if, they, if they're concerned about affordability, then they have to step away from their hawkishness, right? Uh, because the prices, um, have, prices, number one, have gone up. Of, of housing gone up hugely over the last year, something like in some markets, 40% right. price increases, right? And, and not even in, definitely not in a place like New York where prices have been more flat there, but I, I'm talking about in some of these like second tier markets, like um, let's say Cincinnati or Pittsburgh or whatever, that the prices are up hugely over the last year, a year and a half. And um, the only thing that's kept them affordable is interest rates being very low, right? Right, and but they, they now they're saying the board said maybe they will raise rates in 2022, not 2023 as they originally said. So yeah. the market has been so complacent that they're never gonna raise rates. And now all of a sudden, they, they're saying, well, we may raise rates in 2023 or maybe even 2022. So, and they, they have to threaten that. Treasury so bonds are actually going up. So that's like amusing to see. You know, they have to, they have to keep a credible threat hanging over the market in order to uh, not allow what we've actually experienced in terms of inflation actual price inflation, measure, measurable price inflation from turning into inflation expectations. That's what they're terrified of, is that there is an inflationary expectation, such as what there was in the mid to late 70s. And people just planned for 10, 12% inflation and baked that into all their assumptions and um, cost of capital models that would be used in business planning and on down the line. Everything uh, that, uh, that it was the only reason that we had the prosperity in the 80s that we did was the, those inflation expectations uh, kind of collapsed in the early 80s. And um, so all sorts of investments could be made that wouldn't be made in a high inflation environment. But who knows if, if they can't, they, they're, they're caught, kind of caught, the real dilemma that the, that the Fed is caught in is if they raise rates significantly, and I'm talking about, let's say, get them back to just where they were in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, like let's say 4.75% on the Fed funds rate. Um, what would happen is that very quickly, the, um, the current US budget would not even be sufficient to cover interest on the debt. And they, we've exploded the debt by so much over the last, let's say 15 years, that the interest on the debt wouldn't be able to be covered under, if it went back to, a, let's say like a normal rate, like 5% Fed funds rate. So they can't, they may love, want to love, want to take it back that and love that idea, uh, take it back to that level, but it's it's not possible <laughs> unless the debt were to come down um, dramatically. Right, and it doesn't look like market believes them either, given that it's been the bonds are up and the rates are down in the last couple of days significantly. So um, they can talk all, all the one, but like you said, at the end of the day. They probably can't really raise rates much anyway, anytime soon. Right. It's a, they're, they're really caught on this. And, and the, the only, maybe the, the, the only thing that could, um, I, I suppose it's either very much higher taxes than what we have, uh, much higher inflation than what we've had over the past, let's say, 20, 30 years, or um, 
the, you know, some combination of the two. And I think it's probably going to be that third choice, some combination of higher taxes plus much higher inflation. They, they really are, their, their hands are tied on this unless you know, there's only so much they can raise taxes and uh, without hurting the economy. And, and I think even the, even though the Democrats may talk like, well, it's morally the right thing to do or, you know, whatever, um, they, even they will look at the Congressional Budget Office or, or some other um, economic analysis that will say, well, you know, we could raise that to 40%, but it might, if it goes beyond 45%, it might actually hurt the economy and hurt jobs. And, you know, it would, it would sort of soften these, um, the aggressiveness of it. Um, and, and that's what happened under Clinton is, is they actually ended up cutting rates because they, um, some of, some of the proposals were just too aggressive. Even Obama never raised, um, you know, he kept the Bush tax cuts because for the same reason, uh, the concern about the economy. But the, uh, but that's um, kind of the, the, there's, taxes are gonna go up, but how much? I'm not convinced it's, they can go up a lot without hurting the economy, which is the only salvation of paying off the debt and getting interest rates down in the very long term. Right. But, um, but in the meantime, uh, all these risk assets benefit from, <laughs> from the Fed um, having their hands tied. Right. Well, we'll see what happens uh, next week. And uh, like I said, for me, the level 41.85 on ES is where we need to get above to be more bullish. But um, yeah, I think, yeah, it, it'll be very interesting to watch. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see, well, as you say, a little bit of a, maybe we gap down, but then we rally back above. Uh, and what I think is interesting is that we close for really since the first time since March, closed below a 50 day moving average, which, you know, right. it's not determinative, but it's, it's still something that people watch and, and um, it'll be, we haven't, we haven't closed below the 200 day moving average since June of last year. So, uh, I mean, could this be the start of a much deeper sell-off? I wouldn't be surprised. It's coming at some point because this, that's a very long time to rally without a break of the 200-day moving average, which is not all that unusual. I mean, we had a, that big sell-off in March, but then we tapped it in the previous June and, you know, and, and so on. So you know, it's once or twice a year. Uh, has been uh, the norm to to plunge below the 200-day moving average, and it's been a year now that since we've had that anything close to it. Right, and uh, 4100 is to me the next support level, maybe a few points below, and see how the market reacts uh, there if we have a gap down or something. Yeah, exactly. Well, have a good weekend, everyone.